Let me ask you about reversion to the mean. You, you go to great lengths to demonstrate reversion to the mean. Um, the, the markets uh, have um, demonstrated roughly 9% returns very long term, not inflation adjusted, maybe 7% inflation adjusted. Obviously, we've been doing better than that in the last 10 years. Are we due for a reversion to the mean, number one? And number two, what, what does it mean when the Federal Reserve is the marginal you know, provider of liquidity in the market since the 2009 bottom. How, how does that affect stock prices? I know we talk in the traditional way about stocks are determined by dividends, earnings, and how much they're growing or not, uh, and by uh, the P.E. ratio, the multiple with a speculative component. But Jack Bogle never mentioned, like, liquidity, for example. The, so I, I'm asking an open question, but what does it mean when the Fed's pumping all this money for oh, years and years into the economy? How does that affect stock prices. Well, you got to start first with understanding what's the role of the Fed. The Fed is really focused on the economy and on people who are not at work and at re rebuilding the energy and excitement within the economy. And one way of doing that, and the only tool they've got that has real power, is to bring the cost of money down, down, down. And now the cost of money is so low that after you adjust for inflation, Bonds don't pay anything. So using money to rebuild the economy is the Fed's principal objective. They could, they don't really care at all about investors, and they shouldn't. That's not their job. As investors, we take what the Fed's doing and then try to interpret what we would do as a consequence. And when the I interest rates are as low as they are, you got to think very, very carefully. I, I want to get your thoughts on bonds in a, in a moment, but I, I just want to pick up on this because the, the S&P is up 500 percent almost since the bottom in 2009. When I call stock traders, I say, why is the market up 500 percent? In addition to the earnings growth and dividend growth, the, almost everyone will say, well, the Fed isn't pumping money into the market. And traders have come to believe that, that a good part of that liquidity, that money, has found its way into the stock market. Now, nobody knows if, you know, the market's up 500 percent since the bottom, whether the Fed is 20 percent of that reason or 40 percent. or I don't think you can quantify that. But everyone I talk to believes the Fed is a factor uh, in, in, in that. So I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how do, you, how do you factor it in? How does that factor into the old idea that the stock prices are determined by dividends, earnings growth, and the multiple in the market. It seems like liquidity is a sort of fourth factor here uh, that's ever-present. Well, the only thing I can suggest, Bob, is assume that you were on the board, governing board of the Fed. How would you vote? You're responsible for the economy as a whole. You've got large numbers of people that are either underemployed or not employed, and you have a fairly modest level of investment by major corporations, it would be wonderful to have more investment spending. What would you do? I know what I would do is just exactly what the Fed is doing. Would I be paying attention to what that means for investors individually? No, I would not, because it's not my job. Yeah, but for sure money's gone into the market. So I, I, I guess the, the point that, and, and traders tell me this all the time, Bob, but to what extent is the Fed now permanently sort of in the market and how do, how do we factor that into stock prices? I'm not trying to I keep repeating the question to you, but it's an issue that I get all the time. I want to get your thought on bonds. There's a new chapter on bonds. Um, you say the traditional concept of investing your age is outdated. The old 60-40 model, stocks, bonds, is, is outdated. Um, why doesn't it work anymore and what do investors need to do with their bonds? The real answer is a little bit complicated, but not very. It isn't what is the present price or yield of bonds. It's the com and it's not entirely the comparison between bonds for the long term and stocks for the long term. It's all about individuals differ. Every one of us has different characteristics as investors, different amount of wealth, different amount of income, different amount of savings capacity different attitude towards risk. And when you take all of those different things and a different time horizon, when you put all those things together, it makes for a very important way of defining who you are as an investor. And that's what should be governing your way of investing. So the fact that you are 30 years of age doesn't answer the really important question. What's the capacity of this individual? If it's somebody who's 30 and has a high school education, 
and has a very modest level of savings capacity. That's a person that might very well want to do 30% in bonds. But if you were 30 and you had an MBA and you were on your way towards a really interesting career and you knew that you were going to be able to save substantial amounts of money, then you wouldn't look at that 30% as being anything like a sensible idea because you're going to be able to save, 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 and that creates an enormous property value. Then you're going to have Social Security, which is much larger than most people recognize. Then you're going to have a home, and that's a stable asset, but it does fit into your total picture. So what in the world is the reason for having 30% in bonds? There may be somebody in the world for whom that is the correct answer, but they're not very many. <laughs> certainly aren't yeah. everybody. Yeah, I guess, uh, Dave, uh, to me, it's pretty simple. I mean, I agree with Charlie, but it's pretty simple. I mean, record low rates, even slightly higher rates we have now, has meant zero net return in bonds for, for a long time. I mean, I know there are periods where bonds outperform yeah. stocks, but what are you, I, what are you, what's I, the I talk in the ETF I community? I think it's slightly more complicated than that. I mean, bonds in a portfolio have always behaved differently than an individual bond. It's very easy to explain a single treasury to anybody. But to explain what happens in a portfolio of constantly rebalancing bonds, that's a very different pattern of returns in a portfolio. And that whole portfolio responds very differently when you're at the lower bound, which is where we're at on, in terms of interest rates. So I, I think the reality is both that uh, you're not being paid very well for taking on what is at least some risk, uh, and also that it no longer functions the way we used to think about bonds functioning when the sort of base rate was 5% on the 10-year or something. So I think there are multiple things going on there that just make bonds a very difficult asset class to own right now. It doesn't mean that an individual bond isn't can't still serve a specific purpose for somebody. I know plenty of advisors who are still building individual bond ladders for certain clients with certain needs. But the blanket idea that as an asset class, you can just put money in the ag and it will do a certain thing for you, I just don't believe it's true right now. Yeah. Uh, Charlie, uh, your thoughts on inflation. Obviously, we've had some concern recently about inflation. Uh, some sectors like growth sectors, growth stocks, tech stocks have been hit recently. Uh, the relationship between stocks and inflation strikes me as very complicated, but I wonder if you could simplify it in some way. So th there's a certain expectation embedded in stock prices right now on inflation. I don't know what it is, 2 percent maybe. But if it goes from 2 percent to 4 percent, particularly suddenly, the market is move does move on that. Is, that. is that rational? Should investors expect some kind of uh, higher return if uh, inflation moves suddenly, particularly outside of a certain bound? Sure. But it starts with bonds. If you look at bonds, you should always do an inflation-adjusted return on bonds. And that if bonds are not attractive, you're going to have trouble having equities be. If, if bonds are a bad bet because of inflation, the inflation is going to affect equities as well, and it will reduce the value of equity securities, no doubt about it. Yeah. But I must Let me ask you a... If. Go ahead. And those of us who think we know exactly what's going to happen to inflation usually find themselves seriously disappointed.